All right. Hello, everybody. Um, well, Bernard is here too. Excellent. Welcome, Bernard. Um, I thought he, he might be late, but unfortunately, I guess he isn't. Uh, welcome to the AVT Core virtual meeting. I'm Jonathan Lennox. My co-chair is Bernardo Boba. Um, so, uh, and uh, welcome. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, some virtual tips. We are being recorded. Uh, no registration required to end the meeting. Uh, please fill the virtual blue sheets. Um, Spencer has volunteered to take notes there, um, but a uh, note taker, especially because we'll be presenting at one point. Um, you can join the Jabber room if you want, um, but so far nobody else is there. Oops. Uh, and uh, please use your headphones while speaking to avoid echo. Please mute when you're not speaking uh, to avoid background noise, and please state your full name before speaking. Um, Hold on, just one second. Oh, Bernard, can you help my, uh, Michael? I have to. He just emailed us. Okay. Uh, virtual meeting tips. Um, if we have, uh, so do the queue, use the raise hand tool. Um, that will queue, it actually keeps the queue order now. Um, if we have a hum, we'll use the polls, which is in the chat tab. Uh, we also have a poll, I want to mention that in a second. Um, yeah, there's the unmute and unmute tool. Um, you can choose your video if you want, but it's not required. As long as we can hear you, that's what really matters. Uh, agenda is in the data tracker. The notes is in the notes tool. Um, I mentioned just once more, please sign the virtual blue sheet there. Um, Note taker, we have Spencer Dawkins. If we have another person who would volunteer, that would be wonderful. I spell your name right, Spencer. Let me just make sure I spell your name right. Is Spencer still here? Spencer, oh, yeah, Spencer, there he is. Okay. Uh, note well, this is under the terms of the uh, IETF uh, note well policy. So please, um, both in terms of uh, IPR rules and in terms of um, code of conduct, uh, please be familiar with that. Um, and please treat everybody with dignity and respect um, as appropriate. Uh, we have a poll in the chat um, asking uh, whether people will be attending IETF 113 in person. Um, I know a number of people are still undecided and it might depend, including for me, on whether other people will be attending in person. So please answer that poll, uh, including if you don't know yet. Um, that would be helpful. That's in the that's in the chats in the sidebar. Uh, Bernard, do you do you want to say anything? I've been doing all the talking. Uh, I guess you're asking people to respond to the polls. Uh, mm -hmm. So just make sure that and. Uh, and also, I, I, I you know we got email from somebody saying he was having trouble getting in. I don't know if you're able. To yeah, unfortunately, uh, that was a presenter. I'm not sure. Uh, I think they have the link, but um, mm. it wasn't stable. I guess for them, that's why they're coming in and out. But uh, oh dear. Yeah, but a reminder about the polls. So far, it, there's nobody who says they'll attend in person. But I have trouble believing that's really true. <laughs> So anyway, please please vote. I don't know how many. We don't have mm. that many votes. We have about thirteen votes. So. Mm. Okay. So. Oh, sorry. Sorry. All right. Uh, so and then our agenda. Uh, right now we're doing the note well, a brief status update on Cryptex, which I think actually Bernard might be presenting. Um, I'm not sure Sergio said he was going to be able to do it. But if Sergio is here, he might be able to say something. Um, presentation from Harold on overhead authentication. Uh, two presentations on RTP over Quick from Jorg and from Spencer. RTP payload for V3C from Laurie Lolly. RTP payload for Skip from Daniel Hansen. And then next steps. Uh, OK, our draft status. This is going back a little ways, so this might look a little 
better for us than is real. Um, but we have a number of drafts that have gone to RFC, so good work. Uh, VP9 is a misraf waiting on frame marking. Uh, Cryptex past ID evaluation, uh, revised ID needed. Um, I know there's been some work there. Uh, frame marking needs write up. That's on me. I'll get to that. Um, uh, VVC had a working group last call. There were a few comments there. And we've adopted several drafts. Uh, there was a liaison. Um, oops, sorry. A liaison uh, from MPEG, uh, from ISO, ISO IEC about MPEG green metadata. Um, we have a proposed response. Um, I'll briefly put this up on the screen. Uh, this is the liaison statement. It's on some uh, metadata for, for reducing energy consumption during uh, for media. It's a proposed response um, that's been posted on the list. Um, I think I haven't heard any objections to that. Um, basically, it's thank you for the for the um, information and. IETF working groups are submission driven, so if you think this work should be done here, this is an ID. That is a brief summary of it. Um, if anybody has any objections, otherwise we will go ahead and send that response. Uh, just one note, we had a question about where the virtual blue sheets were and it's in the notes page. So if people go to uh, click on the notes page, you'll see at the bottom it has the virtual blue sheets. Thank you. Yeah, so this is just the discussion on the um, on the, uh, uh, the liaison statement. Um, oh, somebody's not uh, oh uh, someone says they're not seeing your slides, Jonathan. Uh, are, are uh, let me try recording? turning. Let me try turning off the video overlay on it. That might save bandwidth on that. Yeah. So let me. Uh, okay, this should be this should be a. It should say set it as lower bandwidth now. So let me know if you still have any so, troubles. Uh, James, is that better for you? Are you seeing the slides now? Yes. Yeah. He says Good. yes. Great. Okay. okay. I'll leave my video off so that, that, for bandwidth reasons. Sounds great. Okay. Uh, now, Cryptex. Uh, Sergio, do you want to talk to this or? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, next nice slide. So. This is the, the current status of the drafts. We have submitted it for um, public request, and we have received some some reviews that it is in the next slides. Please. Okay. Oh, sorry, one second. I just lost my slide. Yeah. Uh, there we are. Yeah. So the first one is an interesting one uh, that it is um, we said in the draft that we are uh, registering the two defined by profile values in niana but there is no uh, registry for the defined by profiles uh, values uh, in rtp so um, i think that the best uh, and the only thing that we can do is just re remove the the this from the from the draft and just define it there without submitting them to iana because there is no registry and the section two is just editorial, and the section four is defining correctly the the the, the IANA attribute for for the Chris's SDP attribute. And I have one question about the the fourth one. I don't know exactly uh, which is the best way forward. So, uh, can I, yeah, you can ask for the SDP directory. I guess uh, is is. Uh, Anyone from the SDP directorate on the call to want to comment? Um, anyway, we, we can ask. Yeah, uh, I think probably maybe we should, uh, should do, I, I don't know, I don't remember the procedure. I guess I guess we ask for that. So yeah, we all send. Yeah, in practice we'll send, it tends to be Krister. <laughs> yeah, Krister or Paul, yeah. Yeah. So. I can so, yeah. also take I can also take a look if necessary, but probably the best option would be just to put a uh, just a cross post to a music, and Paul and Christopher would typically read and yeah. respond. Who who is this speaking? Uh, Roman Spound. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so why yeah. don't we uh, in the notes take an action item to post to a music for us to ask for review. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Okay. Well, either I guess either M Music or the SDP director. Yeah. Yeah. This, this is this is Spencer. Uh, is that action on who? <laughs> I think on it's the on the chairs. On the chairs. Yeah. On the chairs. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Okay. So the, this is the end again. The still open issues in GitHub. The latest three ones are for solving the the feedback from from the review. The first one is say about uh, adding a, a statement about how the the well the second the thirty two one is the how this grid test interact with the uh, RPC sixty nine oh four. Is about um, uh, I think that uh, there is a PR uh, addressing that and what he's proposed is that uh, while it is possible to negotiate and and and, and offering the SDP both uh, RFC S6904 uh, and Gridtex. If uh, a packet is using Gridtex, it should not, it must not uh, use um, the uh, RTP header encryption in RPC6904 because I mean, it's kind of, even it could be possible to implement, but I don't think that it serves no purpose. Mm -hmm. And the first one is uh, also an, is an issue raised, uh, raised by Richard Barnes about uh, and there was some there is some discussion there about if um, it is needed to really put the plain test saying that it is being used as encryption uh, as in, or as in, uh, fed to, to the encryptor or not. Uh, we were discussing early in the draft that uh, it was an implementation detail because um, there could be some implementation that does not really need the, the plain test to be continuous and that it could just uh, fit the the, the individual uh, by, uh, bytes into the into the encryption function and does not need to to re to to reorder the RTP packet before the encryption. So the plain text value does not uh, does not make any sense in the in the spec, and that's why it is not there. But um, if anyone has any other opinion, it would be good if you could just uh, write it down in the issue. And the next steps would be if uh, these uh, PRs are approved, we will just submit a new draft and, and continue with the reviews and post it to a music as you have already uh, suggested. Uh, okay, okay. That's, that, that seems seems reasonable, I think. Um... I mean, actually, the, do we think any of this would need a fresh working group last call, or is all this right just because it's? Um, I guess if it's out, if it's already got, if it's AD evaluation, that counts as part of IETF last call, so it wouldn't need a fresh yeah. working group last call, I guess. But yeah. none of this is some, none of this is cha any change to the tactical stuff. I don't think so. That should be right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, anything else about Cryptex, or are we good to move on to Harold? Okay, Harold. Hello. I'm Harald Augustan, and I have a problem. Well, we know that uh, RTP audio packets are small. We know that if we add, add RTP headers, they are bigger. And then we encrypt stuff, they are even bigger. Now, you would think that once you have a packet that is already twice the size of the original data, a little more overhead wouldn't matter. You'd be wrong. At the moment, we have had a request from various customers, including uh, small customers like the US government, to switch crypto algorithms to use AES GCM to AS256 GCM. There are good reasons for that. One is that it's a federal mandate. Another one is that it's simply a better crypto. The bad thing about it is that on top of all the other bytes we've piled on to these packets, we add six more bytes. 
that's actually a measurable quality impact, which we are seeing in our stats. That uh, when we have slow networks, low end phones, bad connectivity, 6% matters. Next slide. So we, I looked through the list of available specified crypto seeds for SRTP and found that the last one was registry in 2015, which was the AID crypto seed I just noted. And when we discussed this overhead internally, we came up with various options. And one that I immediately said, no, this is not the way to do it was let's just design our own crypto, cut off some bytes here and do a little more, a few more checksums there and speci specify something. I mean, if you want something that's rapidly, rapidly broken, let amateurs design crypto. So RFC 7714 is an example of exactly the kind of guidance normal human beings like most of my programmers uh, need in order to get this stuff, kind of stuff right. So we know exactly what kind of document we want, but the document we have doesn't have any lower overhead alternatives. And so I tried to ask on CFRG actually, and uh, so what why do we uh, what's the what's the what's the reason for for choosing this size of tag rather than that size of tag and well all i can say is the answers were not comprehensible to me which is probably my fault i mean rtp has as a context a reasonably specific need set of needs the basic need is that we need to have the encrypted conversation be non-encryptable, non-decryptable by any adversary until uh, quantum cryptography arrives or the end of the world, whichever is sooner. Uh, if an adversary is able to in inject the occasional packet that contains stuff that decrypts to random bits. That's not a big deal. We have codecs that tend to recover from noise because they were actually written for a time when it was feasible to send unencrypted stuff across the internet. Well, there are ways in which you can leverage the detection of accepted packets into a better guess at the encryption key. That would be a big deal. But uh, I wasn't able to leverage my understanding of the requirements into uh, something that could make a cryptographer say, oh, you, you need this stuff, and it has over over it. So, that's where I am. Next slide. So what I need is a crypto cryptographer vetted solution that satisfies my requirements for lack of key compromise. We need to not have the word SAJ1 in it. We need to not have any crypto algorithm that nobody's heard of before, because that's just not very trust and using. And it needs to be documented to the level of 7714. And if such a thing were to exist, I think it's likely to get deployed and get deployed fast because of this 6% saving in overhead. 
So that's where I am. Now I want comments and feedbacks. So uh, I have a question for you, Harold. Uh, I guess we, we're getting Mo and others in the queue who have some understand the history of this. So uh, maybe we should just empty, uh, em call on people in the queue and uh, see what they suggest. Uh, I think, is it Mo, if Mo first in the queue? Who's, who's got the queue? Uh, I did raise my hand, but I'm sorry. I, I don't see even where there's a queue. The queue is in the participants list. Oh, oh okay. That's where you hide it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes, Justin was is on the top of my list. Yes. Yeah, so, unfortunately, as people talk, they get taken off the queue automatically. So it's a little confusing. So I think Mo might have been first. But. Yeah, Mo, do you want to go ahead first? Um, yeah, so uh, I, I recall arguing pretty strongly for supporting GCM 64-bit tags back in 2015. And the argument at the time was the jumbo packet size could be extreme, not even 64K. We're talking, you know, four, four gig, <laughs> four gigabyte packets. Uh, so that was the justification for uh, not including short tags because the combination of packet size and number of invocations uh, would, would, would lead to a, a, a G hash that could be compromised with, with relatively you know, mo modest compute. Um, so the, the, the irony is nobody ever said, well, can we just limit this to single packet? If you have an RTP payload that fits in a single packet, would it would it would it uh, would it be okay to use you know GCM sixty four bit tags there? And we never brought that up because I think no one no one felt that it was uh, uh, you know okay to say okay you can do this for single packet but you can't do it for arbitrary lengths for arbitrary lengths you have to put the full sixteen byte tag. Uh, so I think it's really more, more just for simplicity. No one ever tried to argue that. We can do it for small uh, small packets, but not big ones. I don't think there's a security concern. I never saw a security argument for small packets for less than you know 512 bytes of something of payload. I never saw a security argument where GCM was vulnerable uh, with 64-bit tags and only you know uh, uh, 512 or 1K packets and reasonable number of invocations, you know, two to the 40 or something invocations, which is the lifetime of the key under SRTP anyway. So um, I don't think there was any security argument for that. It was just not to have uh, fragility in the spec to say, if your packets are small, you can do this. If your packets are big, you can't do this. You have to do that. Um, I think that's why it, it, it was never proposed in 7714. But if it's a strong need, you could revive it and, do GCM with 64-bit tags. You don't have to create a new, you don't have to create some new crypto suites or anything. There's nothing inherently vulnerable in GCM for 64-bit tags and 1K packets. That's hopeful. I have Tim on the top of the queue now. Yeah, uh, Tim Panton. Um I just wanted to question your assumptions. Um, I'm not sure I agree that codecs are happy to receive noise. A lot of them are quite stateful and that's going to be um, it's going to have knock-on effects. Um, and I think the other thing that you maybe need to include in this is the variableness of the size of the packets, um, which is, you know, when, when these original SRTP was designed, packets were pretty much constant length and that's not true for modern codecs. So I think, and there's some information you can extract from that. So I think there's another, that's another criteria you could give to your cryptographers um, somehow. Yep. It would be ideal if we could separate uh, video crypto from audio crypto because a video is usually big enough that, uh, that your, that your, that your, uh, that these six bytes won't matter. Roman? So um, I kind of looked through the history of this because I was wondering about the same thing for a long while. And um, 
one thing that I discovered is like one of the security concerns with, which was brought up, that if you have any way of determining that a certain packet was decoded, for, for instance, if you have access to any sort of stats or uh, RTCP packets, uh, you can use a, a short tag to, be, uh, to guess the encryption key because you are sharing the key for both uh, uh, integrity calculation and uh, encryption. And that was one of the reasons why they uh, insisted on longer keys, because uh, there are attacks which uh, allow you to guess things if you know that so, like some of the generated packets are getting decoded. And do you know, do you know how my, many successful packets that would take? I don't remember, but there is like this is actually in this uh, NIST guidelines why they're not recommending the uh, sixty-four bit tags. Why they uh, why they uh, like depre why deprecating them? Because if you have any uh, sort of uh, back channel for determining that something gets decoded, it's like they determine that this is reasonably um, uh, creates a reasonable security risk. It's a lot less than just random randomly guessing for what. Uh, so uh, that was uh, issue one. Issue two, which was brought up, is again the uh, there is a number of invocations, not just the number of bytes decoded, which there is a limit on for the 64-bit tags, and they were basically saying that if you generate enough junk, you you will you will force the session to uh, uh, essentially it's not again it's not a number of bytes decoded, number of invocations, so you can force the remote party to uh, renegotiate keys. A lot quicker just by sending junk to it and again that was like another consideration for short attacks uh as far as you note on the uh, codex uh, we actually have again uh, there is a consider in a lot of modern codex there is uh, a lot uh, there is a considerable amount of integrity checking so we can probably check uh that uh, the the actual Packet is decoded correctly, so it's uh, so it's a lot less of the concern of the integrity. Uh, most of the time, this integrity check is needed to make sure that there is no compromise or no issue with the keys that you're using, because most of the time the integrity check fails when there is some sort of problem with transmitting the encryption keys. Um, finally, the uh, the uh, one of the possible ways of addressing it is again potentially using two different keys for encryption and integrity because that way we can have like so if the key for integrity gets compromised it's less of a problem than the key for encryption being compromised and we can have uh, uh, and that m might allow us to use short attacks but that will obviously result in the higher uh, resource usage so that's But it, it, all of that will still be uh, a lot more secure than SHA-1, which is kind of the <laughs> consideration here. So we're kind of looking for the perfect solution while we're dealing with an in, in, increasingly imperfect one, which we already have. So, so I have. Justin? Thanks, Harold. Yeah, so I just want to reiterate, like, I, I think there's a ton of value here, uh, all the things Harold mentioned, but then also the additional performance boost of being able to use uh, AES GCM, uh, where all the stuff can be hardware offloaded. Um, that being said, uh, when I, I asked about this in the past, um, I got some fairly icy responses from you know, crypto folks that they were not interested in developing weaker crypto, you know, something with a shorter authentication tag. So that's just something that we may, probably need to be aware of that there may not be as much interest in this because like the, the value of a few byte savings, you know, isn't it, it may not be as large elsewhere. Um, on actually decoding, uh, you know, bad packets, I, I don't think there are as many state checks a, as you might think that I think typically anything that, that passes uh, the decryption, you know, will be fed into the decoder and the decoder is going to try to play it out. There's not a lot of redundancy there and you'll probably get noise. Like in some cases, you might have a length that's off and that'll get thrown out, but um, there's a decent chance that the stuff will be sort of, you, you have to basically be prepared that anything will be played out uh, if it passes decoding. Um, 
The other thing is that I, I, my understanding of the key derivation process here is that we actually do derive from the DTLS key association, the separate encryption and uh, uh, HMAC keys. And I, I could be wrong about that. Um, but uh, I, if that's the, the concern, um, that, I think that that might be actually a, a decent thing to try to push on um, where we don't have to worry about compromise of the actual encryption key uh, if somebody fiddles with the HMAC. So uh, I, I think that pushing on this whole thing of going down eight byte tags is probably a good path because like the one thing that I know is definitely not okay here is taking an existing uh, AEAD output and, and chopping it. That has like known security problems. So move again. Uh, Justin is correct. Uh, we, we do use uh, separate authentication and encryption keys uh, so there's not a chance of, if you compromise the authentication key by doing a lot of forgeries and getting the forgeries accepted, it doesn't compromise the decryption key. The attacker still can't decrypt incoming from legitimate sources. Uh, so th that's that's not a, a concern. The NIST uh, uh, concern that I think Roman was trying to get at was, is not that the authentication key and the decryption key are the same. That's not true for SRTP. It's that the ghash function that's used inside of GCM to derive the bits for authentication uh, could uh, in turn leak the key itself, but that would be the authentication key. Uh, it, it wouldn't just allow forgeries, it would also allow leaking the key for, uh, for that session. But because we use a separate encryption versus authentication key, that would not be a problem for SRTP. So that part of the NIST, uh, uh, warning doesn't apply to SRTP because we don't use the same key. That vulnerability in GHash wouldn't compromise the decryption key in SRTP. Um, and the, the, the other thing was that uh, uh, maybe we can ask people about, do they, uh, do they consider that there, there was a 64-bit uh, CCM for a long time in the, in the IoT realm. Is that still in use or did that die? Or um, did people break that easily? Uh, whatever happened with that? There are crypto suites that do use GCM as 64-bit auth tags. Um, so are those historic? The RFCs don't show any status change. So are those just not used? Or are they still in use and people haven't realized that there's a vulnerability? Or maybe it's just these are small packets and we accept that we're going to rekey after two to the 48 of these small packets. That's not a concern. Yep. So, thank you. And uh, could you, Mo, if you could uh, post me to the RFC numbers of those, just email me the RFC numbers of those uh, crypto seeds that you mentioned. It's probably easier than me trying to find them. So, I mean, as a chair, I feel like this would need uh, guidance from um, CFRG, probably, but um, I mean, you know, or some other, you know, real cryptographers. But um, I think there's certainly clearly, if we have, you know, cryptographers telling us okay, he's clearly interested in this. So, I, you know, if you get that, I welcome contributions here. Maybe it's even just a matter of, of, uh, finding existing things and then being able to negotiate them in DTLS, because I know DTLS can negotiate very many fewer things than our older um, crypto, because we've tried to restrict it just to the things people actually want to use. All right, I think we are probably a little bit over time, so we'll go to York. Thank you. Thank you, Harold. Hi, uh, yeah, I will do the presentation. Um, we'd like to give a short update on our RTP over quick um, experiments. Um, we have the draft already presented last year in July, I think, and then we presented some experiments in November. Um, the draft is um, specifying a simple encapsulation for carrying RTP and RTCP over quick, and it's using the unreliable datagram extension. Um, we use flow identifiers in the uh, or put, to prepend RTP packets, which we put into quick datagram frames to uh, demultiplex different datagram flows. 
And then we also mentioned SDP in our draft, but uh, now there's also another draft which focuses on SDP specifically. And I think we will have another presentation from Spencer on that later. Um, and then the rest of our draft focuses on congestion control. And we have done some experiments on different congestion control schemes for RTP over Uh We tried to answer two questions mainly. Um, the first one is how to do proper real-time media congestion control in Quick, given that RTP and Quick have their own congestion control. And the second is how can we um, reduce duplicate signaling for congestion control in RTCP and in Quick. Uh, we built a small test application using GStreamer and Quick Go, and we integrated them with an implementation of Scream and now also Google Congestion Control. Um, next slide, please. So this is what we have seen already in November. Just a short refresher. Um, we use um, quick acknowledgments for datagrams to um, estimate the feedback we would usually get from RTCP. And since the feedback is not exactly the same we get from quick, we um, calculate a receive timestamp from the latest RTT we have from quick. And um, at the half of that to the send time, um, but that is not exactly um, precise because, for example, the feedback path might not be congested and um, the acknowledgments may be less granular because they are, um, for example, delayed or um, may aggregate multiple acts into one acknowledgement. And um, in the bottom, there are two graphs. Uh, the left one is using RTCP feedback, and uh, I think it's, it's over five um, experiments. Um, and the right one is using the quick connection statistics. And the link is um, here using a 300 milliseconds one-way delay, which um, we used because it's easier to show the problems we found with using quick statistics in this case. On the right side, you can see that for some experiments, the ramp up um, does not work as well as on the left side. Um, this was uh, mostly the case in longer uh, one-way delay experiments. Um, and we think this is due to the problems of um, quick acknowledgments or the less granular feedback we get. Um, yeah, some possible improvements we see here are the um, explicit timestamp drafts. Uh, there are two drafts with this now, um, which would add explicit timestamps to quick acknowledgments, which could be helpful to remove this latest RTT calculation to get the arrival times. And then there's also the egg frequency gra draft in quick, which would help um, managing the timing of acknowledgments in quick so that they are um, not delayed or that the sender can at least control how much the um, acknowledgments are delayed. Uh, then next slide, please. Then we have a short update of another experiment we already showed in November. Uh, the top graph here on the right um, shows an experiment we showed in November, which uses um, Scream and Murino congestion control at the same time. Uh, we use this to um, try out how we could, for example, use one shared quick connection for RTP streams and other non-RTP data at the same time. And um, uh, this graph on the right top shows how our results looked like in um, November. And it was already suspected then that there might be a bug in the implementation. And indeed, we found now a bug which um, led to this problem. Uh, you can see that after the capacity of the link drops to, I think, 600 kilobit here, um, the target bit rate of Scream also dropped quite low. And the problem there was that we had a feedback congestion because our uh, receiver implementation uh, created too much feedback, like duplicate feedback um, records. Um, with this fixed now, we can see that in the middle graph here, the screen behaves more like on the previous slide. Um, and the bottom uh, shows that uh, the Neurino controller on the transport layer in Quick actually doesn't ever react to anything because it's an application limited um, phase for all the time, as one would probably expect. Um, yeah, then the next slide, please. So then we actually tried to send non-RTP data at the same time. Um, and again, we use Scream over Neurino here. And um, the background data we sent here is just some random data over a quick stream, which constantly sends data. Um, and the problem is that um, the Neurino controller, um, or in our first implementation, the um, streams were 
um, our datagrams were not prioritized properly. So our first naive approach to solving the problem that um, the screen data send or takes up most of the bandwidth was to always prioritize datagrams. And um, the problem with that, which we found out, is that um, even if we always prioritize our datagrams in the ramp up phase, it may happen that our datagram queue is empty. And with the new Reno controller um, controlling at the grid transport layer, this would lead to situations where the, yeah, the datagram queue is empty and the stream takes up all the um, remaining um, bandwidth by filling up the congestion window. And in that situation, we cannot um, send datagrams anymore, which then leads to more delay variations again and leads um, Scream to a very low bitrate again. And uh, here on the left side in the graph, we can see the Scream target bitrate actually is almost zero all the time because of this problem. And on the right side, you see the latency and target bitrate. Um, target bitrate, of course, always again zero. And then the latency, we can see the um, sawtooth pattern created by the Reno congestion controller uh, below. And yeah. yep. I believe this problem actually exists in the Chromium implementation of web transport. It does ah, exactly this. Yeah. Very interesting to know. Thanks. Um, we, we tried another implementation. Um, I think it's already been mentioned in previous um, presentations on Scream that, for example, when it competes with uh, TCP, which would be a similar situation, except that in this case, or in our case here, we share the new inner controller for both um, applications. But when con competing with TCP, uh, we saw in earlier presentations that it's um, uh, a similar behavior, especially on drop tail queues, which is the case in our experiments. And then we used uh, another implementation. Next slide, please. That's a Google congestion control implementation, which is a bit more aggressive against the competing traffic. Um, which works a bit better for us um, in the um, target bit rate. Uh, the target bit rate is a bit higher here. It's like more a bit more fair, um, but we still see very high latencies, and especially with the capacity drops, um, we see very high latency spikes, which probably is due to um, multiple queuing in our application and at different levels. Um, so, yeah. So we kind of. Um, can send data over the same uh, connection shared by different um, streams, but it's not really helpful in uh, using the Reno congestion controller below because of the latencies. And um, it might still be better to use a delay-based controller, which we didn't do yet because we don't have a delay-based controller in our implementation available. Um, yep, then to the next slide, please. Uh, so now there are some open questions for the next step we have. Um, we would like to update the draft again. And some questions we have for this are um, RTCP for congestion control. Um, what exactly does the draft need to say about RTCP? Because we have uh, seen in our slide two, I think, that we can use RTCP probably with some optimizations. Um, but it's not clear what exactly the draft needs to say about this. and. Um, specifically which parts of RTCP it needs to address. Um, and then also which of the upcoming quick extensions we have to include in our draft and to reference in our draft to improve the situation. Um, then the flow ID was, I think, already mentioned in November that it's not exactly clear how we use this yet. And um, one question we should probably verify there is um, if this flow ID is necessary and if yes, if the flow ID is enough or if there are more requirements which would require some more complex um, form of demultiplexing. Um, yeah, then the last two questions address the last slide we had. Um, how can we, um, or what, what does the draft actually need to say about different yeah. congestion control schemes at different levels and specifically about prioritization? Um, yeah, and then, of course, if there are other um, questions or comments, we would love to hear them. Thanks. Spencer? I apologize for ask, uh, asking a newbie question. Um, are there going to be any congestion control schemes that you all are thinking about that change uh, the behavior of the receiver, basically that the receiver has to know what the uh, sender is doing? Um, I think 
in regards to RTCP, probably because the receiver needs to um, send different types of RTCP depending on what the sender is doing. And for example, if the sender can get all the information from the quick implementation, it probably doesn't, or the receiver doesn't need to send the RTCP reports anymore. Right. I, I think I'm asking the next layer down, which is, um, which is if 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 I know that I need to send, for instance, some RTP RTCP uh, information or uh, or you know use some quick extension to uh, provide information, uh, would my behavior once I know that. Uh, would I still need to know that the sender was using a different uh, congestion control mechanism? Um, I don't think so. Okay, good. Thank you. That's a wonderful answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Justin? Hey, uh, this is Justin. Um, yeah, I think it would be good to, it might be worth running up both approaches for RTCP, either, you know, what would it take to just encapsulate, uh, you know, the existing sort of transport feedback sort of messages in RTCP. And, you know, then it's basically a drop in, you drop your RTP stack into a quick connection and everything just sort of works. Uh, and then sort of the alternative would be leveraging the, the you know, the, the quick feedback and then you can look at like, you know, what extensions are required to get the same level of granularity uh, in, in the feedback reports. And I think, you know, with that, we can kind of now analyze like the trade-offs of, okay, how much are we saving by not having to send redundant information and, and that kind of thing. Um, are you also interested in understanding like, what is the value we're getting from flow IDs? Uh, you know, we don't have a concept of flow IDs with RTP today, if I understand correctly. So like what, what value does that provide? And I'm sure there's an overhead cost. So like understanding that trade off. And then lastly about you know, things like prioritization and congestion control, it might be easiest to first consider the case where quick is used almost as a replacement for DTLS SRTP and isn't being used you know, like in combination with streams and, and other things. Just imagine a, a quick connection just for RTC traffic. And you know that probably makes the, the case easier because we don't have to worry about competing uh, you know, other things on the quick connection and, and just how do we get good performance over quick in general? And once we have that working, we can then expand it to like, how do we deal with prioritization and interaction with other flows on the quick channel? Yeah, I agree. Uh, thanks. Um, I have Stefan next on us. Hi, Stefan Holmer here. Uh, sorry if I'm not entirely up to date on this, but it seems to me uh, that it would be good to think about like how we, I, or, when, I, when I'm listening to this, it, it feels a bit odd that we are trying even to, to run like uh, Scream and Google CC on top of uh, another congestion controller. Have we uh, left out of scope to integrate deep, more deeply? And I put the congestion controllers inside quick or replace new Reno in this example. Uh, yeah, I think that would be another option. So, so this was just our um, first experiments on doing it in general, um, especially for my thesis work. And um, I think there are probably also options to do that um, to yeah. um, have York on my list next. Maybe. I, I, I also get the feeling that it might get complicated when many of these uh, algorithms also have their own pacing and so on. Uh, and quick in itself also has pacing underneath. So yeah, I just don't really see how, how it's possible to get this to work well. York, I think you're up next. Okay, okay, then, uh, yeah, I wanted to, to respond actually also first, first to Justin, but maybe let me get, get briefly back to Christo. Um, so I think the the integration of congestion control with quick is clearly a scoping question, right? 
Um, if uh, the quick group decides to do some completely different congestion controller and then probably also an extended API towards a, a um, towards an uh, towards an application running on top, um, that is a different question compared to using quick as it currently stands, possibly just disabling congestion control. In any case, you'd need to cope with the fact whether within quick or above quick of um, potentially having real-time and non-real-time media streams interacting who may have demands for different congestion controllers. Um, so, but that's certainly an absolutely valid question. The interesting question is where to answer this. Um, we started by trying to minimize the, the impact on QUIC, uh, well understanding that uh, a tighter integration might be highly desirable. Um, I believe at the moment we have kind of the uh, postulate mandate in AVT core uh, to look at what, what happens if you try to run RTP on top of QUIC without modifying it deeply. Obviously, congestion control and click in quick is pluggable, so we should certainly would also want to experiment with other with other algorithms at some stage. And now I need to remember my response to uh, to, to Justin about um, <clears throat> yeah. So in the I was I was going to comment that uh, one way of it tackling the using RTCP with this leveraging lower layer transport indications could indeed be a choice of a ultimately of an SDP signaling where you either where you have maybe RT, using RTCP as a default and um, then being allowed to negotiate that you don't need to run detailed RTCP congestion control but you actually leverage uh, whatever you can get from below and that could be a simple negotiation where you have figured out what your respective quick implementations can support and then negotiate the appropriate options. One could have a, one could have a construction that allows both these options and chooses one as a default. That's all I had. Thanks, I think that would be useful to explore both those options and write them up in the document. Okay, I think Mal is next. Yeah, also on the congestion control topic, um, while, while I think there's definitely a lot of, um, you know, overall congestion control dynamics and which controller do you use and, and all of that, a lot of open issues around that. I think maybe what may be more tractable is let's try to get some um, uh, base plumbing agreements. What, what is the feedback mechanism for congestion control? Because obviously Quick has acts. And then, you know, Scream and others are trying to use the common RTCP, you know, feedback message. Uh, and maybe some older congestion controls for RTP would use just, you know, reports or the older feedback messages. Uh, so maybe the first first uh, stab would be to agree on what is the feedback uh, approach. Um, so even if you wanted to use, you know, RT, uh, you know, RTP-based congestion control, at least you're doing that by grabbing the quick axe instead of you know sticking another layer of of rtcp feedback messages on, on top of the connection maybe that would be a good starting point is just agree on the mechanics of, of the feedback and then you know then you can worry about the high level controller dynamics afterwards Sergio? This is what Unless you're trying to, to, to get from these questions here in the end. I, I cannot disagree with uh, what Mauro is stating because I think that uh, I, I, I like. You're the, very uh, soft, Sergio. Can you speak up? I can put the, the mic in the right place. So, <laughs> yeah, so uh, I. I I cannot disagree with what Mo was studying because I liked what it was suggested that you could control that with the SDP of an answer. So if you want to uh, use um, stop using RTC, RTCP feedback or for even, for example, NAX, you can just disable it in the SDP and negotiate it. But for example, I um, use some creativity uses of uh, of NAX with no uh, when there are not packet losses. So I may even want to, to have it on even using Quick. So I think that 
restricting to just say uh, having to have everything in 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 quick is not the best option for me and we could control it with uh, the sdp offer answer yeah. as it was already uh, suggested James Grusing. Uh, yeah, no, I, I kind of agree with uh, the direction that Mo is going on on two sort of grounds. Um, the, the first one is is that Quick doesn't, although Quick has a has sort of this nominal uh, new Reno like congestion control defined. Um, implementers can in effectively do whatever they want, and there's at least three different control algorithms out there in the wild today. Um, if the, the discussion on Slack is anything to go by. Um, so it, it may not be, a, and there's there's been a very deliberate call to uh, not have negotiation for congestion control inside of Quick, and it's a very, with inside of Quick, it's a very controversial topic of sorts. Um, and so that feedback loop would actually make a whole lot of sense. But one of the considerations I think we're going to make is that a protocol, maybe not this, but maybe future work, maybe inside of uh, the mock work that I'm doing or, or anything else, will also have to deal with quick deployments where not necess that, that information today isn't necessarily available. So I'm thinking uh, deployments in browser with web transport and so where there is a, a security privacy trade-off that has to be made in those spaces and revealing uh, certain connection attributes uh, it's just something that won't happen, um, and so we've got to we've got to factor those in somehow. And if we go for the feedback loop uh, early on in the discussion, we might get a, a, a fair compromise. Okay, I don't see anyone else in the queue. So I think um, it sounds like there's interest in getting sort of a common format. There's interest in getting a, you know, a writing up of the various approaches so we can have be more specific on all of them. And since this isn't a working group item, that's up to the draft authors if they feel like doing that, but I hope they will. <laughs> or anybody else who wants to write it up. Um, Uh, and with that, I guess we can move on to Spencer. And Spencer's been the note taker. If anybody else can jump in on the notes um, while Spencer is taking notes, that would be helpful. Um, and if it would be okay with whoever's taking notes to continue after my presentation, uh, that would be great too. I'm starting to get um, a little bit not brilliant. Um, <laughs> but uh, if we're moving on to the first slide, uh, that would be great. Oh, yeah. Just do we have an update? Is that what someone volunteering for notes? Just yeah, you're in the right place. Thank you. Um, okay. so I, I just want to make I just want to make sure we actually do have a note taker. So <laughs> yeah, we, are you record you're recording it, right? Yeah, we are recording it, so failing all else, yes. Excellent. Assuming the Dropbox doesn't fail. <laughs> what could go wrong? Um yeah, exactly. so um I so I'm Spencer Dawkins, and uh, I started uh, working on this because I thought that specifying, you know, starting work on S, uh, specifying it, uh, SDP would be helpful to identify questions for RTP over quick encodings. This draft is a rename of a similar draft, which is now pointing to AVT Core with the agreement of the AVT Core and M Music Shares. Uh, my goal today is just to raise awareness of this draft and describe the feedback I've gotten so far and show you how to uh, provide feedback, but won't do that here due to time. Uh, next slide, please. So um, are you, do I have a, a draft structure? Of, yeah, that one. Thank you. This one, okay. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry. That was that, that was a double swift. So okay. um, most of this draft looks like you would expect it to. Uh, so you're defining the quick proto. You're defining uh, 
quick RTP, AVT protos, and you're registering the new protos with IANA in the SDP protos, uh, parameters proto directory. So no surprises so far and no questions, um, in, at least in my mind. Um, so if we move to the next slide. Um, so um, I've actually, so having, having uh, announced this on uh, the AVT core list, I've gotten uh, feedback from Colin, from Richard Bradbury, from Krista, and from Justin. Uh, I am thankful for all of these, and I've created GitHub uh, issues for all of these. Uh, and if you click on the, if you were to happen to pick, click on uh, the uh, sharp one uh, signs out there at the end of each one of these, that would take you to uh, the right place. The, um, sorry. So uh, just like I said, just going through these, uh, does double encryption matter? Uh, are we going to need a quick adaptation layer for RTP, RTCP, like the one that we have for HTTP uh, that gives us HTTP 3? Uh, are we going to have mappings on the data 